The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in this episode are that of the guest and host and do not necessarily reflect the values of sponsors or other associated organizations. Welcome to the Parental Compass, presented by Family Education and Support Services. I am your host, Bobby Williams. If you like what you hear, if you like the vibe, feel free to subscribe. Feel free to leave a comment. I'd appreciate it. Say your child had some early trauma in their life. Maybe they were with an abusive parent or in a bad situation and they're removed from that situation now they're they're safe but they're still showing behaviors that are a result of that trauma what can you do well here to help me start answering that question is scott hanauer he is a former executive director and a overall very knowledgeable guy if anyone knows how to help children who have been through trauma it's scott let's check out what he has to say Over the years, what we've come to understand is just talking about trauma is not really enough, that we also want to talk about trauma and resiliency. Um, and where that came from was back in the early 2000s, we, um, you know, we recognized that a common theme of the, a lot of the young people that we worked with was trauma, and we went to experts at the time to get trained. And what they told us was what causes trauma, how it impacts people, but nobody ever told us what to do about it. So we intentionally uh, connected with research institutions that would help us understand what parents can do, foster parents, adoptive parents, birth parents, kinship um, parents, what they can do to mitigate the impact of trauma. And what we've come to understand is that trauma does not have to be a life sentence that people really can recover from trauma. Hmm. But there's trauma like you're in a car accident or something and you you go through some type of trauma, but then there's also like habitual ongoing trauma that a child who's abused might experience, right? What's what's the difference or why is the difference important? Sure. Um, there is a difference between what we call simple trauma and complex trauma. Simple trauma would be those, you know, some of those things that you just mentioned. If you were in a car accident or you were physically injured or you might be the victim of a crime, those things can be very traumatic events. But we really uh, consider those simple traumatic events because we're pretty sure that they're not going to be recurrent. There is a longer list. Um, of what we now know makes up complex trauma. And those are things that are recurrent. There's like, lots of things that constitute complex trauma, additional things that constitute complex trauma, like growing up in a family where there's untreated mental illness or there's untreated uh, substance use. If anybody grew up in a home where there's alcoholism, you know that it's not a very fun place to be. So there is two categories, simple trauma, traumatic events, and they can be very traumatic. I don't want to minimize those, but the complex traumatic event are those things that <clears throat> are recurrent. Yeah. So say you had a child who experienced some complex trauma when they're younger. How does that or how can that manifest once they're a little bit older? What does that look like? Sure. There's um, lots of different manifestations of trauma um, where kids, uh, it can be manifested in their behavior. They start having more behavior problems. They, um, you know, are fearful of physical harm. They uh, have what we call low frustration tolerance. And low frustration tolerance are kids who give up very easily on tasks that they you would expect kids of their developmental age to e easily uh, you know, go through. Higher levels of worry and anxiety are also uh, manifestations of complex trauma. Sleep disruption is a manifestation of, of complex trauma. Um, some of the work that we're doing on our task force called Thurston Youth Alive, which is the suicide prevention task force, is to really train 
uh, parents and um, you know teachers to really look at uh, uh, you know symptoms of depression and particularly anxiety with kids. I worked with a child who experienced a lot of neglect when he was younger, and when I was working with him, it'd be like if there's a snack, he wants five snacks, or he's always hoarding things and. Yep. There's not a need, like you're not going to have things now, but how can you get a child like that to feel like you're secure now, you're safe, you're going to have what you need? Because it's a hard thing for kids to break out of. Sure. Uh, as parents, our primary goal is to keep our kids safe. And anything that, you know, parent educators talk about, uh, for example, is Trump by safety and kids who, um, you know, have experience complex trauma, sometimes worry about things that they're not safe, they're not going to get enough food to eat. So they do hoard food. Um, you know, and what we encourage families to do with that particular, you know, challenge is to make sure that kids have plenty to eat, they have access to food whenever they want it. But mostly that it's healthy food. And over time, then kids begin to develop, you know, trust that, they, they are safe, you know, with their parents and that, you know, they'll, they will get enough to eat. So pretty soon um, that anxiety kind of goes away. Yeah. What about just general tips or ideas? Like you had a child who experienced trauma, they're having behavior issues now. What can you as a parent do to help mitigate these challenges or help the kids? I think the place to start is to see the behavior problem is not intentional, that the kids, you know, are not doing it to the parent. So you're coming at the child um, or the teenager, quite frankly, or even the young adult, you're coming at them with a sense of empathy. Um, we know that empathy and gratitude when kids receive that um, from their parents, that it actually changes the, uh, the molecular structure of kids' brains in positive sorts of ways. One of the new skills that we've landed on, Bobby, is um, helping parents understand the difference between triggers of escalated behavior and the antecedents of escalated behavior. And triggers are those things that might uh, launch a kid into negative behavior. Uh, sometimes it could be hearing the word no, or they can't have more food, or they have to go to bed, or they have to do a chore. Those are triggers, and they're real deals. Those things do kind of, um, you know, light somebody's, you know, kid's views. But what we're encouraging parents to do more now is to look for the antecedents of escalated behavior, to know the, your kids well enough to know what are the nonverbal cues that your child is giving that they're becoming dysregulated that may be associated with the trauma? So it could be things like a clenched fist, or it could be uh, a, a certain look in their eye. I've been consulting uh, with a family who have a, uh, they're an adoptive family and they have a nine year old little boy. And he has pretty big naughty behavior problems. He's very aggressive, very oppositional, very defiant. And I asked his parents to um, look for the antecedents of his escalated behavior or asked if they could tell me what the antecedents of the escalated behavior was. And the mom um, immediately says, it's a look in his eye, that when he has that look in his eye, that she knows things are gonna go you know, get escalated very, very quickly. So what we wanna do is to encourage parents to, to intervene when, when they see that antecedent or of the escalated behavior and not wait for the trigger to happen. So you're kind of cutting off the behavior before it even starts by just yes. paying attention and realizing like, okay, they're getting agitated. Well, well what do you do if you see them start to, get agitated? Like, how can you, other than noticing it, how can you stop it? Yeah. Um, we've been actually studying that and working on that too. And, and what we've landed on is that kids tend to fit into two categories. There are the kids who do better 
when they're escalated being close to a significant adult in their life. And then there's a category of kids who actually do better when they're more isolated. And it's important that parents know which category their kid fits into. The little boy that I was just describing, he does way better when he's close to one of his parents. So what they practiced for you know a while, a week or so before I saw him again, was they recognized the look in his eye and then they said, they just stopped his routine and they said, let's go sit on the couch and they would get a blanket and you know they would he would sit there for a few minutes and they described that they could actually feel him de-escalate. Now, he might be a kid though, if they said, oh, you need to go to your room because you have that look in your eye, he may have spooled up even more. Mm -hmm. And the opposite is also true. If we, if kids who do better when they're by themselves are um, forced to be close to somebody, it may uh, escalate the behavior anymore. And as I've come to understand that, those two categories, I think we all sort of fit in those categories. Like, I use myself as an example. When I'm stressed out, I'd much rather just be by myself and and de-escalate on 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 my own. But I know people who don't, you know, don't do well that way. Mm. Where's the balance? You don't want to be just a, uh, you know, rigid like hard parent, but then you also don't want to be so soft that a child just walks all over you. And I'm assuming that all ties into trauma too. So how can you find the balance of the two? Sure. I think it's a really good question. I think the single biggest skill that parents can utilize when they know that their kids have experienced or are experiencing some trauma is to be what we call authoritative or emotionally safe adults. And emotionally safe adults have the ability to be what we call high structure, high nurture. And high structure, high nurture means that the parent can balance both of those things. That they that on the nurture side, that they provide pro-social activities and unconditional acceptance and um, you know fun activities and you know physical nurturing. But it's also equally balanced with with structure, accountability, routines. Um, you know, predictability in kids' lives and accountability. So um, what we know is that when kids are um, experiencing trauma or have experienced trauma, the more they're around those high nurture, high structure adults or those authoritative adults, they do better. And what research tells us is those are kids who more securely attach to their parents, they feel more safe and their resiliency goes up. And it's also kind of related to even the environment that families create in their homes that we're encouraging families to um, where their home environment has high levels of predictability and consistency and routines and that things stay the same. Because what we know is that when people are stressed out, they rely on those things. They rely on predictability. Well, and a lot of kids probably didn't have a lot of predictability earlier in their life. And so having a routine, and does that look like just every day we have dinner at six, or we do that, this or that? Is yep. that kind of what you're saying with routine? Yes. And the routine, you know, stays pretty much the same. Not everybody can do it perfectly the same every, um, you know, every day. But, you know, if the routine is, you know, eat dinner take a bath, brush your teeth, read a book, go to bed, that we keep those routines pretty much in, in place. And that people, who, again, people who, uh, you know, want to be, uh, you know, um, when they are stressed out, they tend to look for those routines. Mm -hmm. The other reason that the environment is important is that um, kids have enough stress otherwhere and everywhere else in their lives. And when we want to, when, when they're at home, we want them to have less stress. And we know that high levels of predictability and consistency reduces stress in, in, in people in general, but also in their neurology. Yeah, well, trauma is sometimes not knowing what to expect or things being chaotic. 
What about when they're working your last nerve and you just want to scream at them or snap on them? Do you have any tips for parents of what to do in that moment where you're just feeling really heated? Um, sure. One of the things we uh, talk about a lot with parents is how important it is that the three most important words kids need to hear from their parents is I love you. And the most important time to say those three words is when you feel the least like saying it. <laughs> that, you know, when you're the most frustrated, when you're, you know, the most irritated, and maybe, you know, there's stuff going on in the parents' life that's making them. Anything that we say to the kids should always be preceded by I love you and you're in a lot of trouble. Mm. We talked about previously a brain to brain connection between yep. parents and their children. Explain that concept to me, because that was really interesting. Sure. Um, so some of the work that we've done to study resiliency is that, um, well, um, number one is that we looked at resiliency across many cultures. And what we were probably not surprised to learn is across many cultures, resiliency is pretty much defined the same way, which is one's ability to persevere through, you know, through trying times or the, you know, the ability to, um, you know, overcome obstacles. And, um, and, and so we want higher resiliency in our kids. What we've landed on fundamentally, or, you know, in a very basic kind of way is kids learn resiliency in fundamentally two ways. The first one is that when they have at least one adult in their life who unconditionally believes in them and unconditionally accepts them. The second way resiliency is learned is by watching it and they're watching parents. So uh, when a parent is stressed out and maybe his inclination is to, you know, kind of lose their emotional control, it's pretty important to know that the kids are watching it. And there is some compelling neurological research, research that there are mirror neurons in kids' brains and that they're reading their parents' brains pretty much all the time. A um, horrifying thought. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially if it's a brain like mine. Um, uh, and, and it's also interesting around that the modeling of resiliency is there also is some statistics that say that of all the ways that we communicate to kids, 55% is body language. Mm -hmm. So they're paying 55, they're paying 55%, you know, to a parent's body language. 35% is tone of voice. That only leaves 10% for words. So when we have, you know, and we're a parent who uses a lot of words and who, you know, tends to lecture a lot or, you know, uh, moralize or give lots of advice, what the data tells us is kids really aren't listening to any of that. But what they are paying attention to is the tone of voice and the body language when the parent is talking. And for somebody like me as a parent, that was really disappointing because I felt like I had all this wisdom to give my kids. Um, and it was to know that they're only listening to 10% is, you know, is was a bit of a shock, quite frankly. Well, they're picking up on your overall vibe and your energy. Yes. And it's interesting how kids can be so much like their parents and that energy transfers on. What I always appreciate about talking with you is the combination of research and information and then practical advice that parents can use. So just thank you so much, Scott. It's always good having you here. Well, thanks, Bobby. And, you know, um, I... Uh, have always appreciated our ability to work together over the years. We worked with foster youth together, together. We worked with, you know, in behavioral health together. And now with your work with the bridge, you've become a real institution. Well, thank you. Making a triumphant return to the show, Scott Hanauer. Sometimes when I was working with parents, I would be sharing some of these ideas that Scott talks about. And they would say to me, well, I tried doing it that way and it didn't work. And it's like, yeah, this is something you have to do over and over again. Try it 500 times. 
I say that to say, don't get discouraged. There's no quick fixes, but there are people that can support you. There's resources out there and people can change over time, even adults. This has been the Parental Compass by Family Education and Support Services. I am Bobby Williams. We'll see you next week. Peace.